Let's get started. All right. Hi. Welcome to Navigating the PHP Community. I'm Oscar Morita. I'm going to hopefully enlighten you about the landscape of the PHP community and get you out of here in time for dinner. Uh, if you're here for the API talk, that we sw swapped with Chris Holt yesterday, so kind of missed it, but you'll have to see it on uh, the video. Um, just a quick intro to who I am. I'm currently the editor of PHP Architect Magazine. I've been doing PHP since uh, September of 2000, when PHP 4 had just come out. Um, did a lot of like bespoke PHP development, and my first Drupal project was in 4.7, in around 2007, I think. Um, a lot of fun times. But then I got to work with Brandon, who's in the back there. We, we did a DC United site and Major League Soccer, a bunch of other uh, Drupal sites since then. Um, when I started preparing this talk, I was like, well, what do I want people to get out of this talk? Uh, there are some three key takeaways that I hope you leave the room with today. First, an understanding of PHP's history. What is PHP as a language? How did it get to where it is? You know, how did it grow and evolve? Um, a lay of the land for current projects. So what are the major frameworks, CMSs, tools out there um, that are enabling what is a lot of folks um, refer to as a PHP renaissance. Uh, PHP's gotten a lot of steam and energy back in the couple, last couple of years, uh, which has been you know, fun to be a part of and has been brought back into Drupal. And the last thing that you should get is where to find help. I'll hopefully give you some resources where to go if you're stuck on something, if you need to look for a library, if you want to improve as a P your understanding of PHP programming. Um, so we'll start with a brief history lesson. Uh, won't dwell on it too much, but you know the first version of PHP was PHP slash FI. It's been around for a long time now. 1994 was when it was released, and it was basically just a collection of CGI programs in C, so that Rasmus Lerdorf could manage his home page and like do some form in, in, uh, input, take that in. Um, you know, from the beginning, PHP was never a designed language, right? There wasn't a formal spec first, like with some some of the other languages that are popular now, <coughs> Python, Ruby. Um, it grew organically based on need. If someone needed to do X, you know, they would add some functions, build a light integration layer with some C functions. So it was deliberately designed to just do what, uh, what was needed at the time and, as, and to look like C. It's a very C-like language, very familiar if you've done C. Um, really quickly after that, PHP 3 was released in 1998. This is when uh, Zeev and Andy got involved. Um, they rewrote the parser as part of a college uh, project that they did. This was the first version that introduced extensions. Extensions were really important to the PHP language because then it allowed anybody who knew how to write them to integrate with MySQL or Postgres or Redis, which wasn't around at the time, but that sort of extensibility was really useful um, and helped PHP uh, grow. PHP 4 was released in 2000. That's about when I started learning it. Uh, basically, they bolted on some object-oriented programming paradigms. Basically, they were like really ugly arrays with methods, if you look inside the code. Uh, they also did a lot to improve the performance between PHP 3 and 4. Um, and what was released as PHP 4 is, was driven by the Zend engine, um, the first version. Zend, the name Zend comes from Zeev and Andy's names. They took the first two letters and the last two letters of their names and put it together. Uh, it's important to note PHP 4 was end of life in 2008. Hopefully, no one's running any PHP 4 code or servers in production. To, you never know. Um, that's kind of scary. And PHP 7 deprecates some PHP 4 functions. So if you have a really old code base, you'll, you'll need to do some work. PHP 5 was now released in July 2004. So that's going on 12 years using Zen's Engine 2.0. This improved the object model, added you know, private, public, protected keywords, um, added uh, interfaces, that sort of, a lot of stuff that was heavily influenced by Java's object model. And then each dot point release after that added more useful stuff. PDO, date time class was in 5.1. If you're still using string to time, look into the date time class. It's really awesome for, for doing date time calculations and intervals and all that sort of stuff. 5.3 introduced namespaces, late static binding, and a whole bunch of other features that were beginning to plant the seeds of helping uh, code be more componentized. Auto-loading was a lot easier with namespaces. You wouldn't have to have clashes, um, which, which was really important. 
Five four <laughs> added really important. Uh, big performance improvements, short array syntax, which as a Drupal developer uh, I love. Um, traits were added. They did a lot of work to improve the, the out of the box security. So register globals was removed. So you didn't have stuff magically become a variable just because it came from your posts or your get requests or cookies or any of that sort of stuff. I think my like the magic quotes runtime stuff was removed. So you weren't get slashes added into input unexpectedly, that's that little stuff. Um, the latest version of 5 is now 5.6, or 5.7. 5.6 will be end of life this summer when I last looked. So if you're still running one of those versions, it's time to, to uh, upgrade to, to a newer branch. Basically, the PHP project supports three versions. So the latest one, which is PHP 7, and the previous two, 5.7 and 5.6. Last year, in November 2015, Core released PHP 7, which was a huge performance uh, improvement. Um, basically, they did a lot of work to uh, reduce memory usage, so you're, you'll see much lower memory usage and performance just about doubled. A lot of that performance improvement comes from not having to do a lot of memory allocation and deallocation and all that sort of stuff. They added static type hints, which are huge if you want to, uh, you know, write code that's much more expressive and, and easier to test. The compiler can give you um, some, or your ID can give you some hints about whether you're inputting stuff correctly or not, or do that translation for you if you, your function expects an integer. It'll do that sort of stuff. It's largely backwards compatible. I don't want to spend too much time going into this. I'm going to assume, hopefully, you're went and saw Larry's talk about the new, new PHP, or you're going to watch it online later. There's a lot of cool stuff in PHP 7 beyond just the performance improvements. Um, there's also no PHP 6 slide, because there was no PHP 6. Uh, when 7 was going to come out, the community voted, like, what should the next number be? PHP 6 was going to be a thing years ago, um, and the base, big undertaking in 6 was to add Unicode support for strings. But that turned out to be pretty, like, big hairy beast. Uh, a lot of the improvements besides that um, that were worked on became PHP 5.3, 5.4, 5.6 features that were backported. Um, so that's PHP as a language. Another important thing to know about the history of PHP was Pear, the PHP extension and application repository. This was a very early effort, like early 2000s, uh, effort to promote you know, good classes that were well designed. Um, that could be reused to do stuff like work with databases, forms, HTTP requests, talk to LDAP <coughs> servers. So some very broad applications to very specific stuff. Um, but it was clunky. It was hard to like become a pair contributor. Um, but the PHP community has always been trying to encourage code reuse, encourage good code, pra good coding practices from the beginning. Uh, and pair is, is where a lot of that started. So they also provided the pair installer, which was kind of like Drush, kind of like Composer, where it would talk to their re repositories and install packages and their dependencies for you. Um, pair also not just handled PHP user land classes, but also extensions. So a lot of extensions for working with like OAuth and other databases um, began in, on, on their repository and could be installed through their tools. Um, if the, a lot of those then became bundled part of PHP's core uh, download. Um, my quick opinion, where's, you know, where, where do we see PHP heading here? Um, program, programming paradigms are shifting a bit more. Early PHP code was very procedural, even copy-paste code. You know, you'd find how someone did somewhat, something, uh, you just copy and paste what they did into your script. A lot of times, very junior devs might do that, not knowing the security implications uh, of what they were doing. Nowadays, a lot of PHP packages are very object-oriented. You can download a class, a set of objects that do uh, you know, a set of tasks. A lot of the packages will have testing uh, baked in, unit testing, that you can run a test suite and you know, ensure that there's no regressions, there's no that everything works the way it was designed. Uh, much bigger focus on security. A lot of early criticisms for PHP, even though it was so easy to build something, put a form up, you know, get it to email your, your coworkers, 
uh, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about like how they could be attacked. Some of the early design features of the language made it e promoted bad security practices like register globals. Uh, the mail function it was very easy to inject mail headers and hijack a form. Uh, SQL injection by building queries out of raw strings instead of prepared statements. Um, but those practices are now kind of in the past. And the big one part of this PHP renaissance that I mentioned is, you know, reuse someone else's co uh, code, let them maintain a library that you depend on, uh, write the unit tests and all that sort of stuff, make sure it works on different versions of PHP so you can, you know, just pull in their code, focus on your business requirements, what you're building, what you need to solve. And we've seen that with Drupal, how it's pulled in components from Frame, from Z Symphony, uh, from Zen Framework. There's some stuff in there too. Uh, it uses Guzzle to do HTTP requests and all that stuff. But that's redu let Drupal core focus on building a good Drupal. Someone else can worry about how HTTP requests should work, fail, and all that sort of good stuff. Um, the language is also adopting new capabilities. So we saw. It moved from procedural to object-oriented. Um, there's work going on to add asynchronous coding. So there's projects like React, PHP, and Icicle, which let you do more event loop type stuff in PHP. Like they've added features for functional programming, so you can create anonymous functions, use constructors uh, to loop through like collections of things. Um, been a, a new standard added to promote usage of middleware, which is a way of handling uh, HTTP requests and letting like a bunch of different libraries or code touch that request to turn it into a response. You know, so you know, very early you might have something that checks to make sure that you know the, a user a user is logged in, and later will decorate it to wrap a page around it and that sort of stuff and at the end maybe convert it to JSON because that's what they, uh, the client requested. All that done through middleware which is a slightly different way of doing it than the, just you know give it a big giant PHP script or a bunch of classes to work on. A little more event oriented in a sense. Um, and AP, PHP is also, the, the next part of PHP's evolution is also becoming much more back-end oriented, right? Natural progression, JavaScript is taking over the front end. Everyone wants to do clients, one-page apps, or if you're doing web application, or handheld uh, mobile devices, uh, or doing native apps. But PHP can still be providing the core of that, it can be Drupal behind it, do, handling uh, data input and output via APIs and services. You know, a lot of PHP-powered RESTful APIs out there and literature on how to write and design a good one. Um, and as a result, we've seen, you know, Drupal has brought that into Drupal 8 as a native feature, REST services in core, which is huge and makes it a lot easier to, to handle those different clients um, that, that could be using your data. And PHP is still very strongly suited to handling web requests with session support, uh, reading and the, the request to the web server and then giving it some sort of response. Um, where have we seen PHP applications go? Along with the, this, this evolution of PHP as a language, there's been a divergence and it happened over the last 10 years. You know, there was a rise of like PHP frameworks for PHP developers writing bespoke PHP applications. You know, there's, there's a bunch of guys who see themselves as PHP app developers, but they use a framework to help them out. Um, along parallel to that, there was a, a, a bunch of applications written in PHP for content managing, like Drupal, WordPress, uh, Joomla, and blogging, e-commerce, Magento, and there's others. You know, if you've been around long enough, you remember PHP's Fulton boards, PHP BB, that stuff. There were Nuke sites for a while. Uh, there'd be applications for sharing image galleries before we got Flickr and, and Facebook and all that sort of stuff where you could share it with stuff, with, with people. Um, content management was a very early use case for PHP. Anyone build your own CMS before at an employer? Yeah, and it was no fun to maintain it or get traction until there was a big one. 
Um, but it was real easy, to, you know, to, to build one, reuse templates for display, allow clients to log in and edit pages through some forms, um, put some public forms on the website for people to contact you or do some uh, Q&A kind of stuff, whatever, with forms. It was a lot of fun with browsers because PHP was very coupled to the front end at that time. Um, so you could test an IE678. That, that was always a blast, right? There's still a lot of content management systems in, written in PHP. The top three open source ones, uh, Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla, still out there going strong. WordPress is always iterating, uh, famous for their backward compatibility, right? You can upgrade a WordPress 2.0 site all the way up to 4.2, and it should just work. That's the core goal. Joomla's done a, a, a lot of work to move a lot of their code into their own framework that they use internally and promote. Um, and there's also a lot of other CMSs coming out of the PHP space, more, more modern ones, or newer ones, I wouldn't say modern, that try to use object, more object-oriented techniques from core, in their core. And a lot of them are honestly kind of like, I'm going to write something better than WordPress using object-oriented um, stuff. Process Wire is one that I've heard of. Um, if you ever need to do static sites like Jekyll, you can do that with PHP. Sculpin is, is a cool tool where it'll take Markdown and produce a bunch of uh, HTML pages for you. Um, October CMS is, is another one that's built with Laravel. So this is a still thriving part of the PHP community and, and landscape, um, and it's not really going away anytime soon, obviously. I forgot to say, if you have questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. I don't want to just drone on for 45 minutes uh, here. Along with the need for ap applications to solve, you know, very specific business cases, there was a need for frameworks. Uh, early on, development teams found they were reusing the same components from one project to the next, so you started to build this in-house framework that you would reuse on multiple projects. Um, and a lot of this stands from the DRY, DRY principle. Anyone not familiar with it? Don't repeat yourself, right? So it's very, um, reduce repetition of code by bundling it into reusable functions, classes, modules. Um, Drupal has many qualities that make it framework-like in, in this space, right? You can find modules that will do X, Y, Z for you, sometimes more than one that you have to evaluate which one might work. Um, the first iteration of frameworks were all in one frameworks. They would do everything for you. You just use their components. Uh, for handling common and uncommon application tasks. Uh, a lot of them tried to offer and mimic the rapid application development offered by Ruby on Rails, so use Active Record to make it really easy to write, write to your database, um, make it real easy to write templates for your view layer, and, that, and make routing easy so that you know, this URL maps to this function in a controller, that kind of stuff. The early ones were, that were popular, and if I omitted it here, it's not out of malice or anything. It's just these were the ones that I know a lot of, had a lot of users. And, and some of them still do. Cake PHP is on version 3. It's going strong. Code Igniter was a, another early one. Zen Framework, the first version, was this all-in-one thing where you would download their whole uh, c code base and learn how to write a Zen Framework app, a Cake PHP app. Um, kind of stuff. Kind of as a backlash to this, there was a uh, micro frameworks became uh, the pendulum swung towards that. Or there was a group of developers that that moved towards this way. Um, so a lot of this was codified by um, Ed Finkler, if you know him, in the Micro PHP manifesto. I'm not a Zen framework developer or Symphony or Cake PHP developer. You can see echoes of this kind of like in my hopes. You know, I'm not a Drupal developer. I know how to develop with Drupal, but I can use other PHP tools, and that's part of the whole getting off the island thing. Um, this was a pre this, the basic points of the manifesto is that there's a preference for writing agnostic code libraries, so they're not tied to a specific framework, <coughs> which means like you're not tied into how they talk to a database, how they route um, incoming traffic to requests to a particular function. Um, and you, know, you want to curate libraries and communities from a wider pool with fewer dependencies. I don't want to depend on what Zen thinks is the, 
is the great way to read an RSS feed or parse XML. You know, let me pull in the one I like working with from, from a wider community. Um, of course, this means your application is going to have less code to manage, support. If, if you keep it slim, it's going to be easier to understand like what all the components do and what's going on under, under the hood. Today, PHP has what I call modern frameworks, not frameworks. Um, and as a result of the micro framework kind of pushback, a lot of them went back and retooled as components that are well designed, tested, they can be used independently. So the routing layer from Symfony could be pulled out and used in Drupal because you know, of their abstractions. But you could use something else to talk to the database. You're not, you don't have to use Symfony's database component. Um, some popular frameworks that, that do this are Symphony 2, you, I'm sure you've heard of it. Aura, Zen Framework 2 did a lot of work to make their components, I mean, not just decoupled, they went and looked and said, okay, why are we maintaining a library for parsing RSS feeds if there's something else out there that's, that does it better? Why are we you know, maintaining our own library for doing database stuff if Doctrine or ORM does it better? The newest uh, framework from Zend is called Zend Express. It uses that middleware layer, and you can totally pick your components. So when you actually set up a, a Zend Expressive application, it'll say, you know, what dependency injection can it, container do you want? And it'll give you some choices. What templating library do you want to use? What database li li layer do you want to use? Uh, which is really cool. If, you, if you're you know, familiar with different things, you can just pick and choose exactly what you want to work on. A lot of these also provide a skeleton app. So there's a Symphony skeleton app. There's a Zen Framework skele 2 skeleton app where you can download the whole thing. And it's got the routing, the dependency injection, configuration, all that stuff pre-baked for you using all their components. So, you, so modern frameworks have trended to using the best of both worlds in that sense. All their components can be used independently, or you can get an all-in-one bundle. Kind of bucking the trend is Laravel. Has everyone heard of Laravel? It's pretty cool. It's, it's instead of focusing on that technical kind of design issues, in my experience, from what I've seen, focuses more on making the developers productive uh, and making it real easy to do stuff with you know a minimal amount of code, and the framework just takes care of all of that. As a result, it's a little more coupled to its own components. Though you can use like Blade as its templating library, you could pull it out and use it separately. Um, Eloquent ORM is its database. Uh, access tool and you could pull it out and use it in its own, but it's really much more baked together. Um, it's got a very impressive ecosystem around it. It's real easy to put up a Laravel app. They've got Homestead to uh, automate Vagrant and putting up a dev site and a live site for testing all sites, all that sort of stuff. Um, there's even a, a service called Laravel Shift, which will take your 4.2 site and make all the pull requests to bring it up to a 551 five, site automatically for you. Uh, any questions so far? Good lay of the land. Um, a lot of this was made possible by some standard tooling that's come into vogue in the PHP community that everyone agreed to kind of use and support and was mature enough that the whole community could you know, depend on it. Um, the one you're most familiar with that you've heard of is Composer. Composer is a great tool to manage dependencies for a PHP project. Um, coupled with Packagist. Packagist is an online directory of Composer packages. Uh, so if you need to install something, the Composer tool will look there first when you give it the name of a, of a package um, to download it and resolve the dependencies. Um, one of Bullets isn't up there. That's really weird. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, part of part of this trend has been that um, different groups making their packages available on packages. One that you should check out is the League of Extraordinary Packages. My updated slides when I post them to the website will have it. It's here on my screen. I don't know why it's not up there. Um, <laughs> And they provide really specialized, high-quality packages for image manipulation, file system ab abstraction, working with OAuth. Um, th that, that's just the three I know off the top of my head. Um, 
but if you're writing a module that needs to do something real specialized, instead of writing that, that kind of code yourself, look on packages, look on the League of, PH, of Extraordinary Packages. Uh, if someone's already in the library, you just need to hook it into Drupal. It'll save you a lot of time and effort that way. Has everyone played with Composer yet? Those are pretty cool. It sets up the autoloader for you, which is always a bonus. Um, PHP unit, and there's a, a growing set of testing tools in the PHP community. PHP unit is a de facto standard for unit testing now. So you can test your code. You know, Does this method do exactly what I need? What happens if I give it bad data? Is it going to fail in an expected way? Um, on top of PHP unit, or there are some other tools. BHAT is a BDD tool. It uses PHP unit under the hood. Um, BDD is great for integration testing. It used, implements Gherkin, so you can write very simple features and test cases. You know, when I go to the home page, I'm going to see you know the search input in in this region. Uh, when I click on this button, I'm going to go to this page, or something will pop up. That's great. Codeception is a newer testing tool. Uh, it's It'll do unit testing, it'll do uh, BDD testing or integration testing. Um, its main differentiator is that you write the tests in PHP, so if you're really comfortable as a PHP developer, the syntax, you don't have to learn a different syntax, you just write it in PHP. Uh, very readable PHP is it too. Uh, another cool tool if you're doing testing, you have a big test suite, you want to make sure it's a good test suite is Humbug, which does mutation testing. Mutation testing is kind of cool in an evil way. Because what it'll do is it'll go through your tests and it'll, um, if, it'll do stuff like if, if you're adding numbers, it'll do, well, what happens if, my t if I have a test where I subtract them? Is it going to fail in, in an expected? Is it going to fail? Because if, if it mutates your test and it passes, that's not so good. And it'll highlight those places where it mutated a test and, and, it, and it still came up green. So those are tests you have to pay attention to. Maybe you know, rethink them, break them down, reevaluate how, how they're implemented. So beside, along with testing, there's also QA tools. These are tools not to test if your code works, but if your to code base is um, kind of like high quality code. Um, if you go to the PHP QA tool chain site link there, you'll see there's, a, there's more than those four. Uh, but there are tools like PHP LOC that will measure the lines of code. That, that It's a useful metric uh, for comparison. PHP mess detector is kind of neat. It'll identify potential problem areas. Um, it'll give you a, a different metrics, you know, and it'll highlight functions like, you know, this function has a really high cyclomatic complexity, which is a way to measure, like, how many branches there are in, in a path of code. And if it's really high, it usually indicates that that method or function is doing too much work. You should break it up into separate functions or classes. So it, it can give you a good sense of like, I should go re rethink how this is implemented just to refactor it, not change how it works, just the way it, it's been coded. Uh, PHP Code Sniffer is a good tool for enforcing a coding standard. So if you're going to follow you know, PSR2 or the Drupal coding standard, I know there's a sniff for it. It'll, it'll go through your file and say, oh, you know, on this line, you used six spaces to indent instead of four or you put your braces on the wrong line, that level of, of inspection, which is perfect for a tool to do instead of relying on human um, review. And everyone should just pick a coding standard. Drupal has one, follow it. If you're working on a PHP project, just adopt, I think it's PSR2, um, and have a tool to, to detect that. Uh, PHP CPD is, is a really cool tool. Uh, it'll detect duplicated code. Uh, it's CPD stands for copy paste detector. So it'll actually tokenize and look at like, you know, this function over here or these lines in this function look a lot like these eight other places where those lines are. Maybe that should be a function instead of, you know, cargo culted across a code base. Um, these are very useful for refactoring and improving the quality of your code to make it more readable, you know, less error prone, that, that sort of stuff. Now I'm going to talk about some community rate, community resources where you can go to find help with PHP, find packages, that sort of stuff. One of the big resources, and I know there's a talk on this, is the PHP fig, um, which takes this uh, 
Its goal is to move PHP 4 through collaboration and standards. It stands for the Framework Interop Group. Um, and basically, a lot of the core devs from different frameworks and projects got together at Tech 2009 is when this was founded. Realized they were all solving kind of the same problems, you know, logging, H H handling HTTP requests, uh, coding standards. Um, and if they could come up with some common standards for how they worked, it would make it easier for, for them to share code. Um, so, so they're meant to promote standards for member projects. So the FIG has like 90 member projects. Drupal is one of them. Larry Garfield is a representative. But Symfony has a is representative. WordPress has one. Um, once you get to a certain size, you can apply and, and to, be, to be a member. So there, these are recommendations technically for the member projects, not for the PHP community. That's usually the backlash against It's like, ah, why is FIG telling me how to code, what coding standard I should follow? I mean, they're not, unless you're a member project. But a lot of the community has adopted their standards because they make sense and they make life easier. Um, these recommendations are called PSRs, uh, PHP Standard Recommendation. So their naming kind of led to that weird, we're not, we're, it's only for our projects, it's not for everybody, but we're naming them PHP Standards. Um, but that's just a legacy thing now. Some of the common PSRs, these are the ones that, are, that have been approved. If you go to the link at the bottom, you'll see the ones that are, have been proposed, which ones are under voting, which ones have been uh, rejected. You can see that Larry has a P PSR, I think it's eight, is for hugs. Uh, so that's a fun one to read. One and two deal with coding styles. So, and that the, the main point of that one is just like across projects, make it easier to, to understand each project's code. You don't have to mentally think, oh, you know, Symphony likes to use tabs, but Zen Framework likes to use spaces, all that kind of nonsense um, that can get really blown up, goes away. PSR3 is a, a really cool one, logger interface. So if you want to write a logger that other projects can just drop in or pick a logger that a standard that in, for use in your project. If you pick PSR3, you can pick any one that's compliant, drop it in, your code will just work. It doesn't matter the actual implementation. Um, Drupal, Drupal uses Monolog, or Drupal 8 does, which is the reference, essentially, PSR3 logger. It's great. Um, PSR, PSR4 handles auto-loading, so the naming conventions, how you name your class, your namespaces, how they translate to paths and file names for an autoloader to work. Um, makes, it, makes it a lot easier on your, on your PHP code not having to litter it with require and include statements and making sure you do that before you call a class, try to instantiate a class, that sort of stuff. Um, and autoloading was huge for making sure that, you know, it's so easy to just have Composer pull everything in, write the autoloader, you load Composer's autoloader. Um, that sounded odd. Um, and you just go, I need to do a new monologue. And then PHP engine goes and calls autoloader. How do I, you know, where do I find the, the monologue class and files and load them and all its dependencies in? So you don't have to worry about that. It's a lifesaver. Uh, PSR6 is a caching interface. So how should we work with caching layers? Um, that one was, is pretty new. So if you use a PSR6 compliant caching library, you can drop in a new one that comes out that's better, or you know, swap one that talks to Redis for something that talks to, for, for memcache without having to change your actual code anywhere. Um, you just change the, the object that gets created and inject it early. Uh, PSR7 is HTTP <coughs> message interface. Uh, that's for how do you um, model and handle HTTP requests, get posts, that sort of stuff, and turn them into a responses. Um, I believe the Symphony kernel uses that. The middleware stuff in Zen Expressive is heavily based on conforming to PSR7. Um, and obviously, as you can see from all these, these are things that if you're building a framework, you're going to have to handle these sort of things. Why don't we make it easy to have a standard, write one logging library, write one HTTP request library, and kind of all leverage that work instead of you know, duplicating our efforts all over the place there. <coughs> Uh, another great resource, and I know I'm kind of biased because PHP Architect organizes conferences, but we're also at DrupalCon, so I know you believe in it. Um, there are a packed schedule of PHP conferences around the world along with Drupal camps and Drupal cons. If you go to phpnet slash conferences, 
you'll see a schedule of upcoming ones. They're all over Bulgaria, Sunshine PHP's in Florida, um, PHP South Coast in the UK, there's one in Australia. So wherever you go, you, you can find a PHP conference. Joined In is another big site for finding conferences and seeing feedback for talks and speakers. Yeah, and there's like a tier of national ones, ZenCon, PHP Tech, Benelux is a big European conference, PHP UK as well. There's a whole family of regional ones, kind of like the regional Drupal camps. Sunshine PHP's in Florida, Lone Star's in Texas, and then there's ones in the Northeast, around Boston, Pacific Northwest. There's even framework-specific ones, so like Laravel has Laracon, uh, Symphony Live, they do a bunch of, of them throughout the year. Um, Cake is still going on, they have Cake Fest every year. Um, so if you want to try something out or go improve your PHP knowledge, these are great places to do that. <coughs> Along with that, if you're a budding speaker or have spoken at you know, a DrupalCon before, there's no reason you shouldn't be speaking at a PHP conference as well. There's a lot of overlap. You can share lessons from what you've built, uh, maintain, if you maintain Drupal modules, that sort of stuff. It's also a cool place to meet maintainers of other projects. A lot of times, um, you don't get to collaborate with people who are solving similar problems, but if you go to a PHP conference, you'll run into the folks who, who manage you know, big pro projects like Symphony down to like libraries uh, on packages that you can do. Some resources to get into speaking is the CFP report is a, a mailing list. And I think once a week it'll send you, uh, you know, here are all the open CFPs that you, that you can apply to and tell you if the conference uh, pays for speaker travel, when it is, that kind of stuff. Calling all papers is another aggregator like that. It looks on joined in and sees who's got an open CFP that's accepting speakers. Uh, and then if you need help writing a proposal for a talk, there's Help Me Abstract, and you can you know, find someone on there to help you review your abstract. They'll give you tips on like, you know, are you describing your, what your goal is, your presentation, that, that kind of thing. Um, another great resource in the PHP community <laughs> is your local user group. Um, they're basically the heart and soul of the PHP community. A lot of people get started speaking there, meet other uh, local developers, it's a great place to network, find work, find help on a project if you need it. You know, oh, I can just go hire so-and-so that I met. You know, they know WordPress or they, they do a lot of Drupal. Um, if you need to find your local one, PHP user group has is, is got a map, this first link, um, where you can see what your nearest one is. There's also a saying, if, if there isn't one near you, congratulations, you're the leader of, of, <laughs> of your local PHP user group, you should start it. Um, but seriously, another good resource, Nomad PHP is a virtual user group, so if you don't have one locally or it's you know, hard to attend to, it's pretty cheap to like, pay 20 bucks, I think, if, if that, and you'll see a talk uh, once a month or watch the recorded talk later. Um, PHP Women is another good resource for user groups. They uh, help with bringing in new speakers, mentoring, or folks in the community and support for, for them. They're not, despite their name, they're not just limited to women, um, but anyone who wants, is new to the community and wants resources and help can get, get it through them. Um, and there's a lot of resources for learning PHP. Of course, the knock on PHP is that there's a lot of bad resources for learning bad PHP online, and there's really still old stuff showing you how to do like, you know, queries to MySQL using the old deprecated MySQL underscore functions and building uh, queries th with strings and that are going to be SQL injection uh, gateways. Um, the best place to start is this community resource called PHP the Right Way. Um, there, there are many online for doing X with PHP. Start here, phptherightway.com. They've got you know, sections for coding practices, how to work with databases so that you're doing it securely in a modern way, how to do templating, other security uh, considerations. Um, and there's more. They even take their website and package it as a book on LeanPub. So if you want to have a, a local reference, um, that's a great place to start. Lots of training resources. I uh, know I've heard good things about Laracasts, even though they're specific to Laravel. They do have now some object-oriented videos you can watch. Uh, they have 
jQuery or JavaScript stuff you can watch. So they've branched out and they're, they're one of those self-paced, you watch a video, you can learn. Jeffrey Wade does them. A lot, everyone that I've talked to who uses them uh, has nothing but good things to say. If, if you're looking for live training, Zend is the company that Andy and Zeev founded. They do a lot of training courses. Uh, so does mine, PHP Architect, where you have an instructor. You can work through some exercises together you know, for a couple hours a day. Um, along with that, if you want to find a mentor or be a mentor to someone in the PHP community, there's PHP Mentoring is a site where you can sign up and you know, say, I want a mentor or I want to be a mentee um, and get paired that way. Mentoring, there's a big push um, in, in the core PHP community that, to you know, give back by mentoring and also find a mentor to help you uh, in your career because you know, they've gone through a lot of experiences that you'll probably do or, or will know who, who you should reach out to to ask for help, um, whether it's soft stuff like finding work, issues at, at a job, or more technical stuff. The last resource, there's a lot of publications, not just my company's books and mag and monthly magazine, which I have copies of if you're interested and you have it in my, our, on our booth. A lot of community members who speak have gone on LeanPub and written really good books. If you're stuck with a legacy code base that is just a big ball of spaghetti, you should get PM Jones, Paul Jones's book, Modernizing Legacy Applications. He's got a very nice step-by-step -step way. You know, first you do this, then you can do this, then you can do this, and at the end you have a nice object-oriented auto-loading code base that's easy to test. Uh, Chris Hartges is kind of known in, in the PHP community for promoting unit te or testing, building testable code. He's got a book there, The Guide to Building Testable PHP Applications. As I said for PHP the right way, they took their, the markdown that generates their website, turned it into a book, and if you buy it, you're supporting like their efforts, at hosting like the site and that sort of stuff. Uh, if, you, if you want to know how to uh, deal with security in PHP, Chris Cornut, um, he's at Enigma on Twitter, uh, has a series of books securing PHP. There's core concepts and there's two more. Um, so these are all great references. Um, and there's, that's just the four I, that I can personally vouch for on LeanPub. There's a lot more that are, are really, I'm sure, good resources. Uh, thanks. That's it. So I'll take questions. That's me on Twitter. Please follow me and heckle me. Um, th that link is all, you can go to the session schedule and please leave me feedback. Speakers love feedback. Um, I'd love to know what I missed, how I could have done it better, what I did well to improve this talk for, for next time. And I'm contractually obligated to show this slide as well. There's sprints happening Friday. If you're looking to help get involved in it, uh, these are the times and places. Any questions? What's PSR zero and why does JetBrains keep? Uh, P PSR zero was the first uh, standard for auto loading, I believe. Um, and it was super, superseded by PSR two. Um, yeah, it's just, it was a first stab at doing auto loading and it had some deficiencies, um, but you should follow PSR2 instead. Yeah. JetBrain, the PHP storm bugs you about it? Yeah, it has it, every time I start a project, it says, hey, configure your PSR0 sources. Okay, it might be a sh shorthand for PSR2 as well. As long as you're PSR2 compliant, I think it, it, it should be happy. If not, you can yell at JetBrains, they're down there. <laughs> I was gonna stop. I love PHP Storm, I didn't wanna show, I should have had a tooling thing for them. But they integrate with a lot of those QA tools and have their own in, in there too. So if you want PHP Mess Detector to run and analyze your code, um, or Code Sniffer to automatically format your code for you, um, they can hook right in easily. Uh, anything else? Bueller. Please come and get a magazine. I don't want to cart them all the way home. So if you haven't come, come by our booth, if you have not come by our booth, uh, come on up and get one. Thanks.